I don't think we have quantum. We'll see if it's fine. Laura is so cheating. You drove this in person blade. You can do it then as her alternate. So that's yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. That's alternates here. Uh, how I first covering her pats and then Joe is Rachel. I'm stuck at seven. I think we gotta get to nine. Um, okay. Laura is on mine. Ben can serve as the impersonal head of the herd. So, though he's in person, I count it. So, you already counted all the stuff. Right? Right? So, you may not. Uh, unless, unless we get to the last show. Where it says, if everybody in the room except Austin could please mute your laptops, we won't get that echo. Hey, turn your microphones. Turn your microphones off. Yeah. Anyway, I won't get started. Um, I'm substituting for Laura temporarily. It's not a coup. <laughs> I'm not running for uh, co-chair, but uh, she's going to be a little late. So. Um, I'll to help get started. So welcome everyone, everyone here in the room and those online. And um, we will get started today with the roll call. So I guess we'll go around the room, people here. So I'll start with you, Dave. Dave Napera, MLSA. Rick Soleil, Plainfield Township, PWA. Joe Hunter, ECP. Emmy Eaton, Michigan Department of Agriculture, Rural Development. Amy Lundstrom, Bar Engineering Company. Megan Napier, AKT Curlis. That's our mission program. Dave Hamilton, Nature Service Secretary. Brian Burroughs with Michigan Travel Limited. Howard Reese with U.S. Geological Survey. Chanel, Eagle Geologic Resources Management Division. Adam Wygant, Eagle Geologic Resources Management Division. Uh, Bree Hammontree with Jacko. Austin York, Eagle Geologic Resources Management Division. James Cliff, Eagle Executive Office. Yeah, Eagle. I think we have an Eagle. First, Alexander Eagle. Alexander Eagle Water Resources Division. Hangerman. All right, thank you. Glad you're all here. Uh, we won't do a roll call on the people online, but if you can, help people yep. are in, that will be helpful. Um, let's see here. So we can't do an approval minutes, right? Not an official, but you can. All right. Secret. All right, so uh, the minutes have been uh, supplied ahead of time. Are there any comments on it? We will not be able to fish it, but we might as well get any changes or comments that you have on minutes. I I don't know. I'm going to speak a little bit to the people on the call. They did send a couple of revisions. Kelly did, Tom Frazier, and Michael Frederick. I have printed them all out, so I know exactly what they requested. I don't know if you guys want me to speak to them for those who are on the call, or if you would like to take over. I'm just... Oh. Why don't you ask them if they're online? Okay. I guess what they're just what they're. Okay. It looks like Michael has, Frederick has his hand up, so I'll let Michael speak. Thank you. Um, yep. Two things with the minutes from the last time, and I know we're not approving these because we don't have a quorum, but um, I was listed as just being a non member, a non WUAC member. I'm the alternate for Buddy Sebastian for the Michigan Groundwater Association. I was present that contributed to the the um, quorum, so that needed to be changed. The other issue was um, when the voting members of the council voted to approve the meeting minutes as amended, it showed 14 approved. There were only 12 people that were um, constituted quorum in the room, not 14. And I was one of the 12. Thank you for those corrections. Um, yeah, I didn't also know that that gave you a question. Let's see here. I have. Oh, this is Kelly. I had my hand raised and then I put it down. So I'm sorry for creating confusion. Um, I had on page six in the first paragraph. Um, uh, I had noted that the majority of the applications mm -hmm. were completed in the 10 day time frame, according to the information that was showed in the presentation. Um, and that the recent audit showed that um, there were other SSRs that were taking much longer than 10 day period. Uh, and then when we asked 
what would be the benefit for opening up the statute for revisions. Um, both Dave Hamilton and James, James Clift had noted that the benefit would, would be that in future audits, um, Eagle would be able to show that they're more in compliance. And so just those were kind of missing pieces that I felt might be good for future use. Um, Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, and then if there's, before we leave this, I had sent an email out just like if we're gonna take the time to review minutes and send in like suggested edits uh, to make this process quicker, um, and to keep Brianna out of the position of having to determine if our edits are correct or incorrect. Um, could we just use track changes in a Word document? And then she could track the suggested edits along with who, who made those suggestions. That way they go out with the minutes and we will all have time to look at those before this meeting and probably have a, a, a more productive conversation. So that's my suggestion for kind of streamlining this process and um, getting Brianna out of the middle of having to be the person that tries to figure out if the edits are correct or not. I think that's a really good suggestion. Are there any issues? Comments. Yeah, there is a, we have a deadline under the Open Meetings Act to get the draft minutes done. And I will tell you that it has involved a lot of legal staff time editing those minutes, frequently having to go back and listen to the recording of the meeting to make sure that we get stuff straight. We could, I suppose, if it's helpful to the council, we could have a track changes draft and then a final clean version, but I don't think we're going to be able to make that Open Meetings Act deadline and follow Kelly's suggestion. Well, let's. What about this, Jim? What if you do what you do and you get it? Up, we get it out so the council gets it according to that. But then we have some time as council members to say, "Oh, we noticed some things." We create an unofficial one that we will then have available to the council members before the meeting, maybe just a couple of days before the meeting. But we would then be able to read something with some proposed changes that we then can react to in the open meeting. Well, I suppose it's no reason. It's not the minutes aren't official until we have a quorum and the council members vote to approve. Right. So it's still draft. We <clears throat> would meet the open meetings act deadline to get the draft out. So we could send out a track changes version plus a clean file version if somebody wanted that. Yeah. So I, I think what Kelly suggests and what I and what I would support as well would be that you send out your version that's clean. That's starting draft. And then as council members or other people that uh, contribute and they say, hey, we think we need a correction here, they send that in. That gets into a track change version, which is then uh, given to the council members a couple of days before the meeting so that we have that coming into the meeting. We can review it and then we can talk about that. Yeah, for the approval of minutes. Yeah. Uh, Tom, Tom Frazier has his hand up. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dave. I did have uh, another correction under item 6F. Um, that first sentence implies that I am serving as a co-chair, so I wanted to make sure that's corrected. I did send in a suggestion to Brianna to correct that. Uh, basically, what I was saying is that um, I am currently the local government representative, and to my knowledge, my replacement still has not been appointed by the Speaker of the House, and um, I went on to say a few other things, but just a small correction in that first uh, sentence there. Okay, thank you, Tom. Yep. Tom, we voted you as chair while you were gone. <laughs> No, thank Congratulations. You. You'll never get out of here. <laughs> I was just going to offer on the track track changes is, is probably a little simpler than like it, it may appear. If everybody who has a suggested change to the minutes just sends it in as track changes to, to Brianna and CC some of us as chairs, she can keep track of them. She can compile them into one list and we can send that back out 
Um, I'm not sure whether it's necessary for us to send out like a track changes copy. I think anybody making a proposed tweak can send in their proposed changes in the track changes mode. And if we receive three or four like this time, you can compile those and then we can share that back. Right. Well, if that compiles what I thought should be sent back out. Yeah. yeah. But I think we're saying the same. Yep. So. Right. Any other comments on that? Michael, Frederick, notice that up. Mike? Yep. Just, uh, just for clarification, I know Jim Milne said, you know, it takes a lot of staff time because you got to listen to the minute, you know, the video recording and everything else. We also have Brianna, and just for point, did Brianna get voluntold that she gets to do this, or is she a contract person that is doing this for administrative purposes for us so we're more more effective? She gets big bucks for this. <laughs> I'm a contractor, <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Nope. That just helps me understand the dynamics and, and stuff. So I wasn't sure if we'd like, you know, have to give you a can of Mountain Dew every time you come to a meeting or something, or you're actually getting compensated for this. Yeah, we probably should go remark that. <laughs> so, Your presence is enough. So, all right. Chocolate is always accepted, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Any other comments on that? All right. So, I, I, I think, Brian, if you could I'll make that a procedure going forward, I think it fits into the Meetings Act, and a, so I think we need to, us having something ahead of time that we can uh, more efficiently address. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so we we have the uh, agenda for us. Put that on the screen. Sure. We're just going to this. Yeah. Hi. I was calling because I'm trying to. Lena, your microphone's on mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. So yes. Yeah, so we have an agenda. If you take a look at it. Um, we will um, be going through. We, we have someone new. Uh, in, there's been a reorganization within Eagle that we want to talk about. That'll be next. We're going to have the, the uh, committee chair reports. Uh, we'll have a nomination for officers and committee chairs. We will not, unless we have a couple members walk in, we won't be able to complete it. But we are going to go through the process of talking through that. And then we we'll have the recommendations for the legislative report, budget update, Eagle update. The list of our future meetings. Uh, any questions on the agenda or additions to the agenda? So, still apartment thunder. It's okay. All right. Hearing none, the next item is public comment on the agenda. So, is there anyone from the public that would like to make a comment on agenda items? All right, hearing none. Okay, sounds good. I'm going to pass the, the next uh, agenda item, introduction of Eagle member and department reorganization to uh, Adam. Thank you, Brian. Um, I think Chris Alexander will have some comments too, but you'll notice that I am not Chris Alexander and uh, our department has had a reorg slightly as it pertains to groundwater and the, the Jim's water use uh, advisory unit or assessment unit now resides in uh, what was the oil, gas and minerals division. We're now called geologic resources management division. We've created a section for groundwater here at Eagle that includes both Jim's unit and this groundwater data unit. Part of the reason for this or reorg is under uh, my position, I also serve as uh, the state geologist. I work very closely with John Yelich and the crew at the Michigan Geological Survey and uh, and Western. Um, I've long stuck my nose in, in groundwater issues. Um, we've been, uh, we've set up a groundwater uh, technical team within the department. And when we were looking for a home for the new groundwater database, uh, <clears throat> the, the concept was that we would create this groundwater section, uh, that it would fit well under my, my management in, in our division, and that it's really intended to elevate 
Um, the department's focus on groundwater within that section. Jim's existing unit largely is intact and has the same function that it always has. Um, but as you all know, we've got the new database, data warehouse. We've got big plans for that here at the department. We're now a, um, a data service provider for the National Groundwater Data, uh, National Groundwater Monitoring Well Database. And we just have a lot of hopes and dreams, I guess, to improve data availability, data quality, pulling data out of uh, flat files around the department that might be siloed um, and building that into um, just powerful, powerful tool for uh, decision makers, planners, uh, et cetera. So um, that's how we kind of got here. That's how uh, it got packed under me. We have an open position right now in the, that would be the manager of the, the section. We also have two open positions within the groundwater data unit, uh, 13 geology specialists, which will manage the database. We'll be holding interviews for that at the end of the month. We've also got a groundwater or a, a geologist nine through 11 position coming on board with a GIS focus to help support our efforts with the National Groundwater Monitoring Network and um, the database as well. Jim's got a backfill that he's doing in, in his unit as well. So it's kind of where we sit. I ask for a little bit of grace and honeymoon period as in my arms around this whole operation and uh, supporting Jim's group in all the things that he needs. You can imagine we have a lot of legal documents, financial uh, joint funding agreements, things like that. We gotta get the right names on and, and several that we need updated as well. So really excited to um, work with Jim's gym staff. He's got a great, great crew. So it's getting, it's fun to get to know them and looking forward to working with all of you. Chris, what did I miss? You got it. You did a nice job. I just, I'm here to say uh, farewell for, to all of you. It's been nice meeting you and working with you over the years. It will continue to work the transition. Um, everyone over, sorry about the hiccup. There was a form that we missed. So anyway, pardon uh, that. But uh, as far as our interaction, uh, part of the reorganization will uh, left a, a groundwater geologist specialist under me that will be um, a water resource divisions connection to the groundwater monitoring database and that development. So we'll still be connected. We'll still collaborate. And I really do miss this group from my section. We had a going away lunch for them um, a couple of weeks ago. So um, I appreciate all the ties that we had. And actually, I'll still be peeking into the council and what you're all doing because it's all um, it's all related, um, you know, the water cycle. So I think it's in great hands in Adam's group. I, I was talking to some of the staff over lunch. They're with their people. They're with fellow geologists. So I wish them luck. But I just wanted to say hello and, and farewell. Um, and you leave me in the wastewater world. So <laughs> anyway, if you need anything wastewater related, that's where you'll find me. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I've given these comments a couple times. And so, you know, after a while, when you say the same thing about three, four times, it, it sounds funny in your own head. But that is really a point that I should make is that this new groundwater section is intended to be a service group, a support group for department, for outside organizations, networking with Michigan Geologic Survey, the USGS excited about all those things. So um, we're gonna remain very heavily connected at the hip with our water resources division, our drinking water, um, environmental health division, and uh, the Bill Argeroff, the acting director of water resource division, and I are on the interview team for the, the new section manager. So um, that just kind of highlights the importance of um, our connectivity and, and making the right choices there. Great, thank you. Um, real quick, I would like to thank Chris. Um, you jumped in after Dinah many years ago, and you've been nothing but helpful in the process. Um, you know, you stepped forward, you picked it up quick, you did all the little things and the big things to help us run. So I really appreciate it. 
Thank you. I appreciate it. It's always good. I, again, um, all the technical issues, right? What would today be without a little hiccup, right? So anyway, Adam and his group, I bet the next meeting is going to be flawless. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. So is mine. Are we still there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel, I feel good with Trisha here helping out. So we, we got it. So. Thank you for all your time and that. And thanks to we look forward to working with you too. Support to so you. John Yellich has a question. Uh, I'm going to go with Dave first, and then we'll do your job. Yeah. And we're glad you're here and glad you're paying attention to this. It is a really important program. You've got a good attitude. Uh, one question I have is uh, you said that you were a state geologist. Could you explain a little bit? Because I find it confusing that you're the state geologist here and the state geologic survey. Yes. Yeah. No, it's, it's a great question. Being the state geologist of Michigan, the 16th state geologist since Doug Houghton, is a great um, title to hold because. John Yelich gets to do all the fun stuff and I get to do mine taxation. But really what it means is I'm the biggest geologic cheerleader in the state. Um, as I mentioned, my, my role as state geologist, because in 2011, the Michigan Geologic Survey, which has been part of our group up until that point, split off and went to Western Michigan University. Um, the title of state geologist and some of the functions stayed here because the state geologist um, has particularly mine taxation functions that are established within our several mining statutes. So the cool thing is, is I do still have the state geologist title. I get to do mine taxation, which is not always all that exciting. It's not as fun as the field work that John does. And I serve as an advisor to the Michigan Geological Survey Division and, and Western's Geology Department. But uh, John is the director of the survey. And, and I should also say that even though we're the Geological Resources Management Division, we're in no way recreating the, uh, the Michigan Geological Survey. The survey is flourishing under John at Western and it's in great hands now with Sarah Pearson who brings a a strong groundwater focus so that's how that came to be and it is, it is an odd situation as you know thank you uh john yelich uh, thank you uh i want to say thank you for uh for all the kind comments but also thank you for uh the ability to hire our replacement sarah pearson as the director of the survey uh she brings great skills in understanding Michigan and understanding the survey and all of our things. And so uh, officially she is the director as of July 1 here, and I'm in a 90 day transition period. So I'll be assisting her in making that go, but I wanna thank everybody for your support over the last X years with the council and recommending funding for the survey, because as a result of that support, we're now able to do the things that the state of Michigan hasn't done for almost 30 years, which is understand the basic geology of the state where we need to understand it. That doesn't mean everything. It just means we're looking at priority areas. So I want to say thank you. And again, I'm very happy, very happy to have Sarah here as as a leader right now and able to work with all of you in your group and what we're going to do with the database and everything else. Thank you. Anybody else have any follow-up questions? This is Frank Edelagishek. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure how to raise my hand here, but uh, it took me a little while to get logged in. On my apologies, I came in just as you were talking about the agenda, and uh, but I just wanted to uh, uh, wanted to comment and thank John for his work at the at the Michigan Geological Survey, and I also want to. Uh, thanks for the explanation about how that the geological survey and the state geologist, how that whole thing came about. I've always been a little confused about that, and I really appreciate that clarity. Thank you. I appreciate you saying mine taxation several times, because when you first said it, I thought you said mine taxation. <laughs> We're referring to the administrative burden. So. <laughs> it wasn't still the second or third time you repeated that, that I too. Figured out actual minds. Minds in UP. <laughs> Perfect. Well, with no other questions, thank you for that update uh, and welcome to the board and thank you for your time. Uh, we will move on to item number seven, which is the committee chair report.
And just a quick reminder, the, this, this section will just be the updates from the committees. And there's a later agenda item where we'll cover um, the actual recommendations, if any of them are brought forward, have to present, discuss, or at least mention which ones are coming. So to start out, uh, Megan is not here, so I'll cover the data collection committee. We have not had a meeting since our last water council meeting. Um, following oh, probably a day or so from now when we get our updated uh, contact list, we'll send out a fresh email list and we'll pick uh, probably two dates between now and the end of the year, kind of front load it. Uh, as I mentioned on the last one, the committee hasn't really identified any key recommendations uh, that would be new novel ones that uh, we're likely to bring forward, but we'll have that as one of the key agenda items, whether there are some some key uh, new recommendations that are feasible to bring forth for the uh, final report. Other than that, we have a, a lot of implementation items and uh, luckily have some more new implement implementation items to, to deal with. Um, seeing as that we got the, uh, the great word that we received funding for the 2022 report recommendations, uh, a couple of those are very important um, and will require follow up from the data committee on those two. We still already had some from the 2020 that are underway, so uh, I suspect the committee will have agendas that are pretty filled with implementing, being engaged in the implementation, but first order of business, we'll see if there are any new recommendations uh, for this next report. So uh, my last reminder for the data committee would be that uh, we have a pretty good email list of people who have participated in the past. There's a few that we have to clean off there that we know are uh, no longer uh, with us or actively involved. And we'll take whoever is signed up on, on all of the contact information that Brianna is working hard for, and we'll add those, make a new list. And, uh, and I'm sure we'll still uh, accidentally probably leave somebody off, but we'll try to broadcast uh, uh, the data committee meetings to everybody uh, within probably the next week. I'll, I'll probably be the one that the email comes from. I think Megan's on starting a week vacation, so I'm to look out for something for me on that. Any questions on data committee? Uh, models committee. Okay, with models committee, we have a lot of things that are kind of just starting. And so I think we'll probably come at future meetings that we'll go into detail of, of those things. But the uh, Michigan Hydrologic Framework, I think it'll be worth spending some time on what's going on to get it really going, but we're still in the uh, beginning stages of that. So I, I don't it's not um, I don't think we need a detailed report on that at this point. Similarly with Michigan Integrated Water Management Database. That is just starting, so um, I'm very glad those are starting, but uh, I think we'll come back later time. And similarly with the compiling the key aquifer properties, uh, we are really just trying to get that underway. Um, and the 3D glacial mapping, in fact, Adam, if you can sign the paperwork, if you don't see any of that, I'll lobby you for that. We can get a signature. <laughs> um, so that's how close we are to, uh, to uh, moving on some of these. I'm very glad that we heard that there's funding from the 2022 recommendations. So the models committee, we had two, which deal with the downstream accounting and uh, downstream depletion effects of uh, and stream network. So those are going to be very important studies for us to understand um, some issues that have been on the table for a long time, but this will give us a chance to really dig in to it. Uh, so we're very much looking forward to getting that started. Uh, but um, Jim Mill was just at the point of you know, trying to get together the right people so they can get uh, the grants and whatever needs to be done in place. So that is very early in the process. So I'm very glad to have all of those underway. And as appropriate, we'll be back with, with more details. One thing that I hope I can say is finishing up is the aquifer performance test guidance. I probably shouldn't have mentioned it because it probably would be if I didn't say the words. Um, but I sent that out, which I hope this is the final version. And there's two more things before um, that Jim and I are accepting comments on it. But we do believe that this is a final document and we want to work on it. So, um, but if we give people a chance, if you've got something, please uh, please get it to me and or Jim Mill, and we will uh, take a look at it. The last thing is actually getting into recommendation for the legislative force. I'm going to hold it for that and talk about it at that time. Any questions on all the things that we're doing? I'm not giving you a lot of details. 
Uh, just a quick clarification. You mentioned the funding was going to two projects. Can you just describe the word in? Um, were those 2022 ones? Yes. Yeah. So there's a um, conduct downstream accounting research and it evaluates stream flow depletion effects downstream. That is brand new funding. So we are very happy. Very happy. But they're very old issues because we're going to have money to do something. All right. Any, any other questions? Good to see any online. All right. Uh, next up is the new topics committee. That is usually Pat Skevich, um, and he is on uh, vacation this week. Uh, Rick, do you have any updates on that? Yeah. No. There usually has not been any business for a while. You didn't pass any kind of perfect. I didn't assume so. Um, just checking. Does anybody have any questions about the topics? All right. Kelly does. Oh, okay. Please go ahead, Kelly. Hey, um, I, well, I don't know if there's anybody online that has been involved, but I think this that committee kind of rolled into the uh, grant with MSU and the water user committees, and I just wondered if anyone had an update on that at all. Um, I think it, I, I would, I think that was an issue that they handled and, and tried to carry through. And so, yes, I, I, I've seen some email discussion about um, whether or not we can put a uh, presentation time on, on a future meeting agenda. Um, that is about as far as a uh, as I'm aware that it's gotten so that there we may have an upcoming presentation on it at the next meeting likely I think that's all I have for information sorry I was just get, getting myself organized are, are we talking about the MSU study correct Kelly was yeah. asking if there's any uh, information on that MSU study follow-up we're going to have an update on that in October um, Adam Zwickle is going to come in and give a presentation to the committee. We're, we're in the process of adding that to the agenda. For October. For October, not September. Correct. He, he wasn't able to make the date in September, so we're into October. I've got one thing that I don't know if anybody's going to cover it. Um, there was a large water withdrawal work group meeting that the senator held yesterday. Does anybody plan on talking about that? Because if they are, I'll be quiet. Otherwise, I'll just raise it because I think the council should hear about this. Uh, I don't know if it fits under any of the normal ones. Could we make a point and include it during the uh, open comments? Sure. Yeah, good point. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, Conservation and Efficiency Committee. I hear Kelly on. Is uh, Emily also on? Right. Yep, I'm on. Uh, perfect. Go I was ahead. going to go ahead and great. Um, sorry, I couldn't be there in person today. Um, good to see all of you. Uh, I'll be giving the update today. We did uh, continue with our monthly meetings, but took a break for July. Um, so we just had a meeting in early August. Um, are you able to pull up the slides for us? Yeah, she's sure. doing it now. I'll take four on. There they are. You're, right, you're good. Great. We can see. Um, so we've been doing regular updates on implementation of the 2020 recommendations. Uh, the Water Conservation Best Management Practices Project is underway. That was the grant that was awarded to Alliance for Water Efficiency. Um, so they're making good progress on stakeholder engagement as part of that project, uh, working to gather information from um, the agricultural sectors, as well as uh, Drinking Water and American Water Works Association. So I believe they've done some outreach to Pat um, and folks in agriculture. Uh, they've also been working to get contact information and work closely with the Chamber of Commerce and Michael Lemo. Uh, we did have a presentation that we had the project team present at the Chamber's Energy and Environment Committee about a week and a half, two weeks ago. Um, and so that was well received. There's been some follow up from a few folks from that meeting. And then we've got some regular project check ins that we've got set up on a monthly basis. So we'll continue to keep the committee and the council um, 
up to speed on that project and provide our progress report as part of the legislative report this year. Uh, we've also had progress that we've made on the water conservation efficiency practices in agriculture. So that was another 2020 recommendation. Um, this is one where we were hiring two educators um, that took about nine months or so to actually get uh, some candidates hired on board. I'm happy to say that we have both positions filled through MSU Extension. Um, Andy, Angie Grady is uh, one of the uh, ag specialist that started, I believe, in May. Um, and then Brendan Kelly uh, just started. Um, so he'll be based in Ludington and then uh, Angie will be based in Branch County. They are planning on um, pulling together the advisory committee, which was part of that project um, and getting that up and running by September or mid-September. Um, so we had a good update from our MSU extension partners on that project and we're happy that that project's underway. Um, let's see. So both of those will be putting together some progress updates for the 2024 WUAC report and working with the implementation committee. Uh, next slide. We've been talking in the committee and had some subgroups uh, in discussions around potential concepts for 2024 recommendations. Um, nothing really coming together quite yet. Um, we do have a concept that's uh, not been fully flushed out yet um, that we're working on with a work group that's looking at creating a potential pilot grant program to fund water conservation pilot projects in areas of potential water stress that would be focused at the community level. Um, and that would include hiring a limited term employee to help lead the pilot grant program and then support additional water conservation initiatives and programming. So nothing to present yet to the full council. We need to have some further discussion and reactions to uh, a draft document at the committee level, but um, that's something that's in consideration. Next slide. We've been continuing our speaker series and also um, efforts to better understand what research needs exist and ongoing research related to climate impacts on water resources and water use. Um, at our last committee meeting, we invited Dr. George Smith. Um, thanks, Kelly, for doing that outreach. Um, he's the director of the Ag Bio Research at Michigan State University. Um, and they have a, a new agricultural climate resiliency program that has received funding through uh, Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. Um, so we met and talked about opportunities for partnership. Um, they do host a monthly Zoom call with the um, Ag Bio Research folks. Um, so if that's something that other council members are interested in, feel free to reach out to Kelly or me or Simon, and we can get you the contact inf information for Dr. Smith so that you can get invitations to those Zoom meetings. And there's they're kind of just standing times once a month uh, where there's updates given on the ag bio research and the specific climate resiliency program. So if there's nothing really to talk about, then they'll wrap up early, but it's a good way to make some connections. So we were really interested to hear that uh, they've been doing some survey work of growers and one of the top priorities identified in the survey results of Michigan growers was climate change and water, um, particularly water use. So there's a number of um, faculty positions that are funded that'll be reoccurring funding for these positions going forward. Um, one of them will be focused on ag economists, um, water use, water quantity, and then some water quality specialists. And then they'll also have some social science behavioral change folks that'll, um, and then some work looking at modeling and field work functions and how that works together. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for partnership with the Ag Bio Research um, Climate Resiliency Program. Um, and it was great to connect with Dr. Smith. I think we're looking forward to having some future conversations with him. I'm not sure if we have another slide. Is there one more? I think that might be it. Um, we did also talk at the last meeting, just very briefly, that um, there's uh, funding now for the 2022 water conservation efficiency recommendation that was included in the budget that was looking at um, creating a irrigation mobile lab. Um, that's something we were talking about repackaging for 2024. So we're going to have to kind of go back as a committee and talk through how that funding might be able to be used to support um, that project going forward, given that we got a later start on um, the water conservation efficiency uh, agricultural strategies project. So, so we need to have some further discussion. We didn't have a lot of information about that at the time we met, but looking forward to picking that up this fall. 
Anything else I missed, Simon, or anyone else from the committee who's on with us today? I don't think you missed anything. Thank you. And we're super excited uh, about Sarah's new role, but we're also very sad to have her leave the Water Conservation Efficiency Committee. So we're looking forward to having a replacement for her role, but uh, I don't think that she can be ultimately replaced. So, um, so that's our update. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Emily? No. Thank you very much. Um, just a one quick question process wise for me. You mentioned on one of your slides that uh, the general gist of the recommendations that you might be thinking about um, when we get down to item number nine, do you want more time and detail on that or just want to let it stand with that that slide that you presented for now? I think we'll, we'll just let it stand. We're still drafting up something in writing for the committee to look at, but um, had some initial discussions. Perfect. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> moving on to implementation committee. Laura, you are here. I haven't looked online to see if Doug is. Or he was not going to be able to make it today, so I'll give a report. Um, at our last meeting, we did confirm that everything that was still outstanding from the 2020 recommendations that the, that this council made uh, is either finished or underway. So there's so there's been activity on all of those items. Um, and so we've we've updated the spreadsheet that kind of tracks all of those action items. Uh, anybody who would like a copy, you are more than welcome to have one. I know we discussed last time some of the difficulty with trying to make that like open access for everyone, but we're but we're still we're happy to share the copies with anybody who wants one. Um, and then for the 2022 recommendations, we've got to start thinking about of the appropriation that is coming in. You know how does that how does that get spent? How does that get worked out with Eagle so that we can figure out uh, application for those dollars as well? And then in the meantime, we're uh, we're get gearing up and getting ready for collating all the report pieces. Any other thoughts for us and all the other committees on the report drafting? So really, one of the one of the things that we had talked about was from an organizational perspective, kind of to be a little bit more of a clear division of kind of here's what's happened already and here's new stuff that we're working on and or asking for so that it so that it's easier for someone reading the report to understand kind of this isn't new things we're asking for this is just us telling you here's all the stuff we're working on here's the new stuff that we're asking for so so we'll see a little bit different organization in the report this year um but we'll still collect together any you know any recommendations that are coming from any of the committees to include those this is Frank Edowagishek, and you mentioned uh, that you have a, a list uh, of uh, uh, where we're at in terms of implementation. I, I would like a copy of that if you could get that to me. Yep, sure will. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. All right, we're going to shift gears now and talk about uh, nominations for officers. Uh, we've visited this uh, once or twice, but essentially with our first four year term uh, well past us and most of all of the reappointments done, uh, we thought that you know there's uh, it's only good process to make sure that everybody had an opportunity to be nominated, nominate somebody and make changes in chairs, dry chairs, uh, committee chairs that uh, the group felt necessary. So we've been trying to uh, provide that. Uh, we don't have quorum in person today, so we won't be able to vote on those, but I wanted to take a minute and run through where we're at with those nominations, just to make sure um, we have one understanding so that if anybody feels different, they can raise their hand today or follow up shortly thereafter and say, hey, you missed this, or I want to nominate myself or somebody else for different things. Um, Brianna had sent out a list um, of where we were, so you might have looked at that, but I think we discovered that there was a few uh, duplications or confusing points where people had just signed up to be members of a committee. 
and some of those got relayed. We don't really need a vote to be a member of our committee the way we've always operated. If you want to be on a committee or on a committee, you just got to make sure the chairs know to act. So there's no no sense of um, kind of spending more time on those. So um, really focusing on uh, tri chairs, executive committee, and then each of our committees. <laughs> By and large, what we have today for nominations is I'll, I'll call out the exceptions, but really the people who are serving in them today. So um, for tri chairs, we have Laura Campbell, Pat Skevich, Brian Burroughs. For executive committee, we have Dave Maturin, Adam Wygan, uh, replacing Christine Alexander, uh, myself, Laura Campbell, Dave Hamilton, Pat Staskevich, and we had a nomination for Buddy Sebastian to join the executive committee. Uh, again, on the executive committee, that, that is not in hard governance, how many people we have. We were talking about adding five new people. We might want to uh, crop down on it, but it's just an addition of one. So at least uh, in my mind, that doesn't really necessarily entail voting to remove somebody. Um, you can vote to just add some. Uh, models committee uh, remaining is uh, the nominees would be Dave Hamilton and Katie Lindstrom, who are currently serving. Data committee would be Brian Burroughs and Megan Tinsley, who are currently serving. Conservation and efficiency, I have Emily Fennell listed. And a question uh, here at the meeting is, Kelly Turner, you've been uh, serving as a co-chair for that. We didn't have you listed, but can I presume that you are willing and interested in continuing to serve? Yes, that would be a good presumption. Thank you. Thank you. I assumed, but wanted to make sure I didn't for too long. And if you wanted. This is Frank Edowagishik. I would nominate her for that position so she doesn't have to do it for herself. <laughs> uh, thanks, Frank. A lot of us will do that. <laughs> uh, implementation committee would uh, be Doug Needham and Laura Campbell currently serving. And then we get to the new topics committee. Um, my records, I might be missing. I only have Pat Staskevich as a co-chair of that. I'm not sure if I am missing someone else. So if I am, please speak up. If somebody is interested to be a co-chair of that, but we also did have an open discussion thread that Pat kind of presented of whether or not that committee does need to continue on in a standing form or whether we can help dissolve that committee. Um, and and, and Pat's, Pat's Express wish has been to dissolve that committee, except for as you know, if needed on an ad hoc basis. Correct. So not to well, for two reasons, not to complicate the nominations with uh, a different motion to dissolve that committee. But for today, um, I would say that we'll just let the nomination stand at pat, um, and then we will pick up at a future meeting when we have a forum the dissolution of the new top committee. Uh, this is Frank Edwagishik again. Uh, what what's the date for the next meeting? It is September 10th. Thank you. September 10th. And we're just falling short here in person today. And my count is that we have about seven voting members in person, and it thinks about that. We're close, but not there. So okay, um so we don't need to, to do uh, any motions and voting that would be inappropriate, but um, with me having said those out loud, Brianna has those notes that she can send out to everybody after this meeting. Um, is there anybody online or in person now who think that we have that list of nominations wrong or incomplete, that we missed an email, we missed an intent? Um, any corrections to that that people feel strongly about or know that can identify today. For anyone who's been inspired, I really want to chair this committee. I can also post in this group chat too that list I've been sending out, the Excel sheet, so you guys can look at it. If you haven't gotten like my email, or if you have and it's gotten lost because there's a lot of emails, I'll just drop it in the chat too so you guys all have it on file. I just have a question on that. So the the last time you sent it, the email was about a week ago. It's different from what you just mentioned. Is everybody aware of that? Is that intentional? Yeah, that is intentional. Okay. We just cleaned it up. Like I said, there was members. And then I noticed because it looked like I was signing up to be a co-chair of all the committees, um, which I was not. Uh, 
<laughs> so we've cleaned it up and the new version that will go out will be a reflection of what I just kind of called out. Okay. Got it. Anything on mine? Okay. All right. Well, that's it for today on that one because we can't vote, but I just wanted to make it really clear where we're at um, and a new list will get sent out. And the first time we have quorum, we will do, uh, do a vote. If there are some new nominations that do um, mix it up for any seats that are kind of set at a certain number, uh, we will have Mr. Wygant um, take over governance of that section of the next meeting so that none of your current tri-chairs are overseeing an election for ourselves. Um, but I would say if it remains a consensus thing, we will that process where it's done. And, and then we will basically operate with these people in place now. We'll just have to make it formal at that point. Um, there would only be one case of that, and that is a choice that, um, I guess that is a choice. Uh, it's interesting government. So right now, all of those people are currently serving because they were there and serving previously. We have been working under sort of an open extension until we could get quorum and get appointments. So um, I think it's a little bit at the leisure of everybody. I think the, the one addition would be adding down um, by Sebastian to the executive committee. And if, you know, there seems to be, I think that there's a prohibition against us including him immediately. Uh, and in fact, I can't really do that. So it takes a vote, but um, but in effect, we can do that in practice. Well, and, and also in practice, anybody who wants to listen to an executive committee meeting, you are more than welcome to do that too. They're not secret. It's cat herding. We're we're planning out the agenda. So <laughs> definitely no secret, no secret things going on in the executive committee. Anybody who wants to log in for one is more than welcome to. Um, and since we don't have details of the committees in any kind of bylaws or any kind of legislative documents, um, really, it's just consensus and will of this council as to who's on all of these uh, all of these committees and who chairs them. I guess what I'm thinking, I, I just feel like include buddy and uh, you know if if an election decision is different, that's fine. But I don't see any reason to say we've got to wait. I I don't see a problem with that. I don't feel any different. I can't really ask for a vote on it. I'm for it, right? For concurrence, but I, I think as much as I could do without a vote, we'll say that probably practice that. Any other thoughts or questions on, on this nomination of officers and committee chairs? Anybody would like to step up and do one of these? It's really not um territorial situation um or your willingness to give your time so John has a comment I, I just wanted to say you covered a lot of details Brian and uh I know that uh, Brianna said she was going to send it out hopefully we can get that summary so that we all have an understanding of what you went through before we yes. leave are you okay. going to be able to post a new version? Yeah, I'm working on it right now. She's working okay. on it while, I, while juggling. I got it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And for something that comes up, I'll um, yeah. I'll even type type this up inside. Okay, thank absolutely. you. No problem. All right. Um, where are we on? We are number, number nine. nine. Okay. Number eight. You're on. Okay, eight. thank you. Uh, little number. So recommendations for the legislative report. Uh, we'll go back into kind of committee structure. Um, I said that for data committee, we don't have any today to discuss uh, models. Go ahead. Yeah, so we have um, one new thing that we've started talking about. I think I mentioned at the last council meeting. And the, the thinking is that be really nice if we had a study that really dug into this um, stream flow depletion. So that we could dig into it, have a study that includes uh, a um, data collection. So we've got stream flow measure, we've got um, aqua performance test to get uh, aqua characteristics down, we've got um, monitoring of water level days, we've got monitoring wells, a place where we have a number of irrigation wells where we have cooperation from the owners that we can know exactly what they're doing, when they're pumping, when they're not, what they're pumping, 
they may put uh, meters on or whatever. But we can have an area that we can say we we've, we've got information we can control on as much as we can. We also have uh, other data collection and you know other things. And that we, as part of this, we also then create a model that we can drill down and pull this information together, try to really understand what's going on with stream flow depletion. And um, we've had some discussions. We had a representative from the state of Wisconsin talk about what their program is. We had someone from the U.S. Geological Survey talk with us at the last meeting. And um, I sent out his report. And if anybody would like to try to send it anywhere else, but everyone that was on the models committee uh, list has a copy of this report. And I highly recommend reading it because it is an excellent report. It kind of shows what we would like to do in this study so that the models can be in the amount of detail where we can look at the stream flow through the area under study, see where water is being depleted, see where water may be coming in from, from sources. We can see how the wells are pumping and how they affect the stream flow and maybe affect each other. Um, so it's, it is an excellent study. And in that study, they looked at management scenarios. What if we stopped well? What if we uh, 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 scaled the well back? What are the things that we could do to manage and that would have an effect on the stream flow? So all these kind of things can be done with that level of detail. And I think what it will do is a number of things. It will give us um, the ability to better understand what is going on in the stream flow depletion. There's a lot of questions that, uh, that go around. Is this really happening or is it not? And I think that with the combination of the data collection and the modeling, I think you can have good answers for that. Um, I think it would be very worthwhile doing. So um, Howard works with U.S. Justice uh, Volunteer to put a draft for us to start working with the Models Committee. Uh, we will uh, start working on that. We'll come up with a nice, uh, good efficient name as to what this will be. But that's, uh, and generic, generically, that's what the topic is. It's to be uh, dealing with stream flow completion, a very in-depth study, uh, data collection, plotting. So um, I think it's something that would be very worthwhile for us to do. It complements very much a lot of things we're already doing, and it certainly fits with questions that are coming up. So okay. two questions, uh, buddies the first, and then Kelly. Okay. Yeah, I want to say, Jim, I, I commend you on having that report there. That uh, that was really informative, and the thing I was really impressed about was they really took their time. They didn't they didn't get a report out to get a report. They took their time and put a whole bunch of data points together and a whole bunch of information um, and gathered all the real science and everything. It really came up with some real numbers that were basically unarguable by industry and regulation whatever it showed it showed it was very good thank you i think that's a really good comment i appreciate that well said comment yeah yeah um at the last meeting i think there was talk about there were like three or four kind of pilot projects that were done and ongoing and is there an opportunity to use the data and the information from those as well and kind of combine all of this together to give us uh, a, uh, an even better picture? Um, Kelly, I think so. I mean, the timing is, may affect some things, but there certainly are adjacent areas of interest. And um, I definitely never want to become too siloed and say, oh, this is a downstream economy. It doesn't affect anything. Well, it does affect other things. So we will be, as we're interfacing with the work that's being done, we will look for ways to um, both aggregate information, to use information in multiple places where it will, might be useful. Um, we're going to try to be very intentional in designing this thing as well so that we get multiple benefits out of it. So, for example, uh, we may have an area that we plan on modeling as part of the development of the Michigan Hydrologic Framework is going to be, on the, be developed on the regional scale. But we may say that there's a subset of that where we can dig into if this one that we're talking about. That could become a subset of the, the more regional model. And that actually would be a great demonstration from a couple of points of view. It's going to show the utility of regional models and what we're doing with Michigan Hydrologic Framework, as well as um, getting into an area where 
uh, we're getting at a fine enough scale level that we can understand it better and then uh, they don't believe that we'll speak uh, kind of directly like that. Like what he was saying, it's a, um, the report is excellent. I encourage you to look at it because it is the kind of thing that we are looking for. Not that scale, that's, that's a bigger scale, but we're looking at there's hundreds of wells in that one. But the idea, if you look at the output from that and um, kind of input that they put into it, that's what we're looking at. Does that answer your question, Kelly? Yes, thank you, Dave. I, I was going to ask, um, <clears throat> kind of on a similar line, think that there's any connections or synergies between that and a couple of the recommendations from like the stream fortification study type of stuff from the 2022 where yes, maybe there, there, there is. And, um, you know, we are, we will get it to the point where we're uh, coming up with the implementation plan for that study. But at the same time, we're going to be designing this one. So I think it's a, a great opportunity to have a lot of synergy there because there's, there is, uh, I won't say overlap, it's not overlap, but there's a chance to use data for multiple purposes. What would you wish of the committee between now and the next, the next meeting? Uh, well, not the committee, but the body as a whole. Should, uh, will you present more from the draft thing, or should everybody try, you know, to commit to reading some of that the report material? Well, the, the, video? The, the report, I think, is if you're interested in these kind of details, it's an excellent report. If you don't, if you don't get into modeling and, and these details, don't bother. We will cover it at a higher level so that you understand what we're doing. But if you really want to understand the principles of what we want to do, that's an excellent report. But it is a technical report; it's not a you know, general. Um, Population type. Did we did we record the guest speaker from Wisconsin covering? I think we did. I thought it said yeah. yeah. I think we did. So if there are maybe committee members who are interested in watching it, maybe not reading it immediately the full detail, but wanted to watch something, yeah. we could get that to them. Jim, that was recorded with Mike and I, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Is that available yet or It should be. Okay, so yes, so that would be available then. Uh, contact him from point in the right direction. So if, there's, so if there's any committee, any members here that want um, maybe falling short of reading the published report, but want to watch the video of the models committee meeting last week, where the guest speaker showed what they did in Wisconsin, uh, maybe a little bit more digestible than hitting a paper. Uh, Email Jim and he may be able to provide a way to get that video in your hands to watch. Yeah, and since I'll be on annual leave after tomorrow, if you can also. Austin, you get the. Yeah, I didn't record it, but if you. Can. I'll be around. Yeah. I'll be recording it. Okay. Yeah. Hannah. Me and, me and Hannah. Yeah. Okay. And otherwise, I'm right now. I'm just doing this for information, just make sure mm -hmm. there's some understanding as to what we're going. We will at some point have a more detailed report or recommendation. So probably some some basic report have a lot of details, and then a shorter recommendation that ties back to that. That's what I anticipate. Uh, to it, but we will be doing that. Excellent. Okay. Um, and you other recommendations from the committee that are likely or is that committee one? Well, that's the biggest one. The other will be that we've been talking about a lot of things in the models committee and we may come up with recommendations on those. And um, um an example would be with the um the web squared method. Um I want to come back to that. I can expect to have a recommendation. I'm not sure exactly how that's going to fit into the report, so I'm not sure we need legislative changes. But anyway, we will need also approval if we want, want to do with that. We have two studies that are just going on, which I wish we were six months or eight months ahead because they fit in well. But uh, with some of the um, here we go. So these are things. So the um, Filing key aquifer properties for use in the tool and the, the 3D glacial aquifer mapping. Those are ones that I think I would like to have recommendations for this go around up in the, for the council. 
But what I'm concerned about is that the timeline, we are just starting these and are we going to have enough to be able to give full accounting for a recommendation by the end? We may not, I don't know. But if uh, if we don't, I guess what I would like to do is bring to the council what we do have and talk about it in general terms. And something that's like, for example, when I say we will cover this at a high level for the report, uh, we will come back later and flesh out what a recommendation is going to be. I think that may be a very appropriate way to go. And well, so, it's, yeah, and since those are recommendations from 2020, that could be part of the here's work that's underway. But some of these we will want to institutionalize from based on that, take some action, which will declare council action. It may not have to go through the legislative process, but so we may be able to tell the legislature this is what we're doing and come back later to flush out our 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 recommendations to action that we think the department should take. Just a quick note, and I did drop the recording from the models committee meeting in the chat for this meeting. So thank you, Hannah. If for some reason you're not able to access that, let us know and we'll get it to you. Thank you. And, and there may be some other things. We're talking about a lot of stuff now, but there are some things. Those are the main things that I would like to bring forward. There may be some other things that bring forward as well. Those are the things. So there's three that deal with the tool, and then this one that um, deals with the use thing. Yeah. Any other questions for Dave? Not hearing any. Thank you. Um, implementation, new topics done probably for this, and then uh, conservation and efficiency presented uh, an idea of what could come from their committee. So, I think unless there's other questions generally about this section, got a little bit of a view of um, the recommendations that might emerge in the next two months. I guess would be when they have to emerge. In order to stay on time. Um, I also say that, you know, something that we haven't done, but uh, just to say it out loud is we, we are required to report at least every other year, um, but there is no uh, prohibition. prohibition, thank you, on reporting more frequently. So if, for, for example, we do a report that's very heavy in the progress being made and we're not quite there on a lot of recommendations, but Within 12 months afterwards, we we are ready with a bunch of recommendations. As stuff gets implemented, if we use it, we can always choose to to issue a, a more frequent more frequent report than what's called. And that may be appropriate because the 2020 work was delayed so much that our original intention is that that work should have been completed by now, and that would be a basis for recommendations this year. I understand. Data committee, a couple of those 2020 work got on your bed. Future recommendation. So understand. Perfect. All right. Um, we're now, I think, going to cover a budget update. Um, I don't know if we have any more detail than what we've already covered. The fact that the 1.2 million for the 2022 recommendation was included within the budget signed by the governor. Um, so we'll start the preliminary work on, on that again. That one is not available until October 1, 2024. But um, the good news is that that is there for us going to move forward. Uh, I don't think we have any more detail on this one. Okay. And on that, I'd, I'd like to say for, for any of the members that did uh, advocacy and communications to help get the funding for the 2022 report, um, thank you. Aware of all the efforts that different people made, I know Dave Chair, you went above and beyond the call. Uh, and it's deeply appreciated. Uh, my group tried to do stuff, had our members uh, do emails, and phone calls, and uh, I think it, it is, you know, a lot of learning to come from it. That uh, took a couple of years. We might not have done the right outreach and communications, even when we thought we were doing it. But uh, to be able to kind of band together, get attention for it, and to get House, Senate, and Governor to all approve it in a conference committee when it was not proposed in any of these budgets is pretty pretty unique cool thing. Um, so whatever whatever all of us were able to patch together towards the end here was pretty good, and we should probably next time take a new reexamination of how we communicate and try to get attention for the recommendations. Um, the standard fare might not have worked so well, but um, 
we got we got very fortunate to to see the have them see the value in this this time. Sometimes you just got to get the right person to your you know, people that are in the positions to go ahead and put a placeholder in the budget. Fortunate enough to have a vice chair appropriations committee be my state senator, and uh, I talked to Sam Singh as majority leader and also on the Eagle appropriations for the Senate. So once we got those folks rolled in and then we got the house rolled in with Rachel Hood and a matter of getting to be able to talk to the right people. So all we wanted was one half of 1% of what James said there was $250 million left on the allocated. <laughs> well, <laughs> not that he had this, the ability to discuss it, but I thought I mean, one half of 1% of this stuff, you know, something that should have been done a couple of years ago. Anyway. We're all very, very happy that uh, that stay that way, and it's nice to see the you know, department help us out. So. Perfect. Any other questions or comments on the budget update? On my end. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Um, moving on, we have the Eagle update. Who will lead, Jim? Say you. Yep. So. To start off with, good afternoon. This is the program update for Eagle. I'm going to turn it over to Simon Belial from the Office of Great Lakes and let him talk about the five year program review draft report for the Great Lakes Compact. There's hard a few hard copies around on the tables. Um, it was sent out electronically, but I will turn it over to Simon for a few slides to give an overview. Thank you, Jim. If I could have my first slide up, please. All right, thank you. Well, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm yeah, Simon Belial with the Office of the Great Lakes. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. We'll talk about the uh, five-year review, or as it's long named, the five-year water management and water conservation program review. I call it the five-year review. Um, so, as uh, Jim alluded to, the five year review is a compact requirement. Uh, as a reminder, uh, for those who don't work with the compact every day, like I do, the compact is a legally enforceable contract among the Great Lakes states, which made the states implement a water management program. The compact also bans the diversions of water outside the Great Lakes basin, things like that. So, uh, legal document that we're working with and um, each uh, state and province in the 10 uh, jurisdictions that border the Great Lakes uh, do complete the five-year review. There's a separate document that makes the Canadian provinces do it. So all 10 of us are doing it at this time. So the compact requires each of us to uh, review the manner in which our water withdrawals are managed every five years. I'm seeing in the chat that John Yelich has not seen the slides. I see my own slides right now, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, but anyway, where are we in uh, the process? Um, so earlier uh, in the spring, um, MDARD, Eagle, and DNR worked together to create the, red, the draft document that um, that you uh, received and then also Brianna uh, put a, a link to it at the very beginning of the meeting. And then the um, draft went to the Compact Council and Regional Body for review by our fellow states and provinces by the end of June. That was also the kickoff of our uh, public input process, which uh, where we are in right now, uh, public uh, input until Thursday, August 29. We're hosting a government to government consultation with our tribes uh, on September 17th. Uh, since I sent out my slide, we, we've uh, landed on date on September 17th. And then uh, once we've integrated all comments that we've received, we'll uh, deliver the final report to the Compact Council by the end of the calendar year. Next slide, please. And with the timing of today's meeting, we want to make sure to get the Water Use Advisory Council members uh, a little extra time for any comments. So we'll we'll welcome your comments uh, by the end of Friday, September 13. Please don't read the thing and anything in effect that it's a Friday the 13th. But if you have any comments, do send them to me. 
uh, I'm going to put my email in the chat. And um, those will be taken into account as we uh, prepare the last version of uh, of the report. Oh, and then uh, last uh, next slide, please. And I wanted to take a minute to talk about what we have observed uh, as staff as we've reviewed our program. Um, we focus on any changes that have happened since 2019. Um, we've had no uh, changes in legislation or regulations that implement the compact in Michigan. Um, one of the things that did happen since 2019, and we're very aware of it in this body, is the, the creation of the Water Conservation Efficiency Committee uh, and uh, 20, the funding of the 2020 recommendations. And one of the things that we've been doing a lot more of since 2019 is different outreach activities, more targeted outreach. And then finally, uh, something also that this uh, committee is, uh, or council, excuse me, is very aware of is uh, the emphasis on groundwater. Uh, Jim Milne talks to this, uh, this every single meeting. So that's kind of what we've observed over the last five years in, in our review. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions now, or you can reach out to me uh, after this, after you've read our document. So that's all the slides I had. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thanks for bringing this uh, to our attention. Um, looks like it's a good document to read. And thank you for the extra time. Um, we have until September 13th to provide your comments to Simon. Uh, any questions on this? Is that the sentence? I believe. Yes, yes, it, yes, I did send it out. It's also in this group chat, but I'll send it out again after year two. So. Should have it electronically. Thank you. Any other questions on this section of the Eagle update? All right, for now, we'll hold off on this. Maybe after everybody reads, uh, we can decide whether anything to discuss, but I appreciate this being highlighted to us. Yeah. All right, thanks, Simon. I'm going to skip the next slide because Adam already covered the reorganization. So moving on to progress update on some of the 2020 recommendations. So first off, the Michigan Hydrologic Framework, Eagle Water Use staff met with project teams for both the Michigan Hydrologic Framework and the Michigan Integrated Water Management Database projects. Contractors also started work for the Transition Probability Maps project. And we've got a joint DTMB and Eagle bid review team that are currently reviewing bids submitted for the updating WWET aquifer properties and updating the tools user interface IT projects as part of a larger compilation of IT projects related to the tool and the batch tools. Quick update on the Eagle Groundwater Data Management System. So, Earthsoft was selected as the contractor. And they are going to be adapting their environmental quality information system, otherwise known as Equus database for use by Eagle. And we are smack dab in the middle of uh, development team meetings. In fact, there's one going on right now that Ross Helmer is attending. Okay, a quick update on Aquabody. So, as far as to the best of my knowledge, work at the Aquabomic facility continues to be delayed. Eagle RRD Remediation Redevelopment Division Geological Services Section completed drilling shell and deep monitoring wells at the Amboy Township Hall in Hillsdale County. That's the first of three locations. And then they are currently, as we speak, drilling monitoring wells at the second and then the third locations. Um, I don't say branch, but that's actually Hillsdale County. And USGS will be installing transducers in the monitoring wells to record groundwater elevation data. Groundwater elevation data will be posted on the USGS website. Are there anything you want to add about that? No, they're going to be real time wells, so they'll be 
uh, updated, I think, hourly. Uh, and then it's indicated if they're provisional, if it's new data coming in, it gets indicated that these haven't been checked yet. And then when the technician checks and verifies, then the color changes and you'll see it's approved data or provisional. It should be interesting. We don't have a lot of uh, observations in that part of the state. And we have some colleagues in Indiana and Ohio who have wells not too far from there. So we'll be able to get a better picture of the region. If anybody needs to find out where that USGS website is, let Howard know, or you can talk to me or one of my staff, and we can direct you to the website. You can also use that for real time stream flow, stream gauge data as well. Okay, moving on to program metrics. So the part 327 program year runs from July 9th of the previous calendar year to July 8th of the current calendar year. So July 9th, 2023 to July 8th, 2024. Our youth assessment staff are going to be drafting the annual legislative report for Part 327, which covers some, but no, not all of the metrics that are going to be covered in the next few slides. We had 252 registrations authorized during that period through the water withdrawal assessment tool. Another 166 registrations were authorized by site specific reviews, including. 84 that were late you know the 10 day deadline we had we also received seven voluntary requests for site specific reviews none of which all of which were done within the 10 business day okay, this graph bar graph shows the withdrawals that were authorized during 2024 July 9th, 2023 to July 8th, 2024. So as I said, 252 in the green done through the tool, then 166 in the bluish color done by SSRs. This pie chart, so as of July 8th, 2024, that 162 SSRs that we processed we have four denials, 16 were retracted by an applicant, and six were still pending, plus uh, 162 that were authorized. Of that 162 that were authorized, 18 ended up as zone A, 34 were zone B, 71 were zone C, 20 were authorized as geology pass, in other words, the zone A geology pass meaning that our geology review concluded that the pumped aquifer is not hydraulically connected to surface water. And another 19 withdrawals were authorized based on using existing registered or baseline capacity. Then, as I said, four SSRs were denied. As far as timeliness, Again, the statutory business deadline is 10 days. Our average number of business days from receipt of SSR request to completion, 14. And 49% of the SSRs were completed within that 10 business day deadline. This next set of graphs show the cumulative timeliness trends. Top graph shows the trend in the average number of days to complete the SSR. And the bottom graph shows the trend in the percentage done within the 10 business days. In 2023, 2024, roughly 90% of the SSRs were completed within 20 business days, which was the basis for the discussion in the Miles Committee about potentially extending that deadline from 10 to 20, but that still remains under discussion. Next slide is our Pre-screener reviews that we do for Eagles Groundwater, Drinking Water and Environmental Health Division. Essentially, this is our staff doing a site-specific review for a public water supply withdrawal. Then 
we provided the results back to drinking water division. So we did 27, seven of which resulted in zone A, five were completed as geology pass. Like I said, the pump dock is not hydraulically connected to the stream flow surface water. Two were zone C, we had zero denials and four were authorized as the basis so based on replacing existing baseline capacity. Sorry, Jim didn't mean to interrupt you there. What about the rest of them? Seven zone A's and five geology passes and three. Good question. I will have to. <laughs> I'm going to have to have a chill and get back to you. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Jim, I think the zone B, there was quite a few of those that came through. It's not listed on there. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Zone B reduce? had quite a few as well. I don't know if that just got missed on the bullet point. That's where the remaining nine might be. Yeah, that's what's left off of there, apparently. Okay. So, we have... so there's tag offers, nine on zone B. No. Yeah, we only had 18 come in in that time frame. The first so instead of 27, it should be 18. Gotcha. All right, we'll revise that. <laughs> no, we had a lot of uh, zone Bs there, which have been missed. That's what it is. Okay, moving on to our permits that are required for newer increased withdrawals over 2 MGD. So in that same July 9th to 23 to July 24, and he issued two permits. One application was retracted by the applicant, and we have four applications that are still pending as of July 8th. So we've got a few that are out on, currently out on public notice. Compliance metrics for that same period, July 9th, 23 through July 8th, 24. Canada sent out 104 compliance communications, so 12 after the fact registrations. So if a withdrawal was installed and or operated differently than what was registered either through the tool or an SSR, if there is stream flow enough to authorize it as build as operated, we issue an after the fact registration. Four requests for to address missing pump information. 76 revised registrations. So when we're notified that the yes, build is installed is differently, and there's again there's no stream flow, we will amend the registration, send that out. And 12 compliance communications sent out to property owners to ask whether they've in fact installed the withdrawal or not. During that same period, we also sent out 17 violation notices. Nine of those violations were closed after they came back into compliance. So there are eight still outstanding. And in, of those, we sent out six second violation notices. So I'm sorry, my math is wrong. So nine were coming, came back into compliance, but the other six, Still outstanding. We set out a second VNs for those. Are there any questions? Jim, can you give us an idea of what the violation notices are for? Those that aren't registered, you know what, where they were installed and operated, uh, using more water than was authorized through the registration. Those are the main two. Thank you. And this is this is Frank Kedowigishik. Uh Jim, I'm, I was noticed that you had a uh, uh, that you were talking about municipal systems, and I'm just curious if uh, if a small municipality wants to put in a well that will triple its its uh, availability of water, but that water is primarily for say another use like 
Nestle had proposed once with with the diff, with one of the cities in the state. Uh, how do we review that that application from the municipality? And is that still reviewed? Is there any special criteria that would be used for a situation like that, or is it still just a city applying for more water? Thanks. Well, that's if it's bottled water. If it's a newer increase withdrawal larger than 200,000 gallons a day, so 10% of that 2MGD permit requirement, Part 327, Safe Drinking Water Act, that's administered by drinking water. If it's a newer increased withdrawal for bottled water over 200,000 gallons per day, that requires a permit application under seven, Section 17 of the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is what happened with. Nestle now Blue Triton for their White Pine Springs facility, which the Blue Triton subsequently surrendered back to drinking water. Yeah. Well, I asked that question because uh, of the call we were all on the other day uh, talking about large water, large commercial water uses. And I just was curious uh, how we would be dealing with that situation. And I know we're going to talk about that issue later, so I'll. I'll I'll wait till then for the rest. If it's for some other use other than bottled water, and it's not for a public water supply, then it would be we would do it under Part Three Twenty Seven. But I think what he's asking is if if the municipality says, "Oh, I want to increase my capacity by two hundred thousand gallons," they don't have to tell you what it's for. It's not some use. They're increasing the municipality. The question is right. that would be done through the. That would be done through the Safe Drinking Water Act. So they would contact, they would do a pre screening request to us. We would review it, but they would tell, we would know about the increased capacity, but not necessarily purpose. So, Thank you for rephrasing that uh, question in a better way. That's exactly what I meant. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question, Jim. So at, at one point, I remember we talked about maybe having these reports on, an, on a calendar year basis. There's oh, something that's a little awkward about it. It's, you know, it's a July, and also you're, you've got half of an irrigation season and with another half of another irrigation season. We've got two irrigation seasons in one report. But then, we have, in response to that, we have been at other meetings mm -hmm. doing calendar year to okay. date, but because All right. the program year just ended, this okay. is the first council year right. after that, so we're reporting on the program year. Right. And, Thank you. September, that's, we'll go back to our cumulative calendar year. Okay, thank you. That's that's what I thought was confused me. But I know this legislatively that's what they said. Yeah. But I appreciate Bill because I think it actually puts things in better context. And the legislature might actually buy a better value too. They don't know what they hear. Any other questions? Uh, Uh, Todd, is your hand raised or did you already ask a question? No, nope, my hand was raised. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, on slide 26, you had a bullet that talked about updating the transmissivity or the hydraulic, the aquifer characteristics. Um, that update, is that, what is the, what is the basis of, of updating that? Is that just expanded well logic database or is that from additional uh, aquifer tests that have been conducted in the state. Okay, that is multiple. So, in addition to <clears throat> when the tool is developed, the groundwater model, the aquifer properties used by the tool's groundwater model were based on the WIM project groundwater inventory mapping project, which only included well logs up to 2005. So part of that project will be incorporating everything in well logic post 2005. But in addition, that will also include updated aquifer properties for aquifer pumping tests and any other <clears throat> any other research. So does that answer your we, question, Todd? It, it does. Uh, I do have a follow up question. Um, I know when we were we were looking at streams and stream gauges, we had about what almost 5,600 streams 
or watershed areas with like 147 stream gauges. Do we have similar numbers for aquifer tests? How many aquifer tests were there? Um, I mean, we know the number of well logs, obviously, in well logic, but do we have a number for how many aquifer tests there were uh, in the WIM project uh, versus how many actual aquifer tests have been run since then that have been added? That's a good question. Is the state watch on the line? I am. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Um, memory serves that the uh, drinking water aquifer performance tests database is around 300 at the moment statewide. We are hoping, but we have not yet achieved obtaining another 250 to 300 aquifer performance tests that have been done by private consultants uh, for ag irrigators. But because there's a client um, ownership issue there, it's, it's not so easy to just assume that those will be coming in. But in a best case scenario, the project for updating aquifer properties might have as many as 600 um, aquifer performance um, test data points. And by the way, the the improvement in the well logic uh, data set itself is phenomenal. When we did the GWIM project in 0405, we had less than 250,000 data points to work with. We now have 600,000 data points to work with. Uh, not all of those will generate a transmissivity due to data problems, but we should easily have well over a half a million data points to repopulate that transmissivity map. Does that answer your question, Todd? It does. I was just trying to get wrap my mind around how many of them were, you know, full term aquifer tests, you know, 24 hours plus um, versus how much of it was texture based. But I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for for Eagle on the update? All right. Not seeing any, we'll move uh, to the next agenda item, which, which is just the mention of our future meetings. You can see there it's September 10th, then October 8th, November 12th, September 10th. And the key reminder, of course, is that September and October are going to be where we have to ramp up on recommendations, discussion, um, drafting of uh, progress to implement um, in the different committees. And November is a great time to edit. December ideally is a great time to celebrate that the report is already completed and <laughs> out the door. Um, so that means that uh, everybody's uh, engaged participation uh, over the next couple of months are going to be the most critical that we've had. So please do everything that you can to, to be here in person so we can clean up some of the minutes and officer votes and be here uh, to really get the work done on new recommendations. All right. Um, well, there was you know, the meeting. Yeah, we're going to bring it up next. Okay. Uh, open comments, uh, next agenda item. Uh, this is where typically we have anybody, um, public or member, can bring up something that's not on the agenda. And uh, so be thinking about what you want to bring up and talk about. But Dave, you uh, why don't you throw people in on? Yeah. So a lot of us from the council were involved in this, but I want, I just think the whole council needs to know about it. So I'll start. Maybe others have more background, more information on it that would add to it. There's a large water withdrawal work group that's been formed by legislators. A Senator Beyer seems to be the key person on this, but also Representative Hood is involved and there's other legislators. I didn't get all the names, but a number of them are involved in this. The issue seems to be that large data centers uh, use a lot of energy and they need uh, a lot of cooling water 
to um, keep their center cooled while, while they're processing all the pictures that we take on Google and whatever else. But these are huge uh, database process places. And so the amount of water that's used um, starts at a couple million gallons a day and it goes up to maybe five million gallons per day. Um, the concern is, is that when legislators heard this, they have to I mean, sound like a really big number. And then became very concerned, are we going to cause a problem in Michigan uh, with data centers coming in? And apparently there's interest in having multiple of these data centers coming in in various parts of the state. So the legislators were concerned. It became an issue among some of the legislators. Uh, I had heard nothing about it. Um, so maybe some others that can fill that in. But uh, Senator Baer, um, Hard work to kind of look at this, and as I understand it, she wants to basically understand what is the current regulation, and it is that a permit would be required under the existing law. So I think they need to understand more about that. What requirement, and that may just be the answer. If they understand that if they need a permit, they're satisfied with the permit process, that may be all they need here. Although they may um, have other concerns that they would at least have want to talk about or maybe have addressed. Um, and I was invited in this as a last minute thing. I think other of us may be as well. Uh, but one thing I did is I invited um, the legislative aides from Senator Baird's office to come to the 101 seminar for the process that I put on this morning, and they came. So I was very glad that they participated. They asked good questions. I think it was very important because I explained to them how the existing process works, as well as how the printing process works. So I think it will give them the background that's going to help them down the road. Uh, again, as I see the issue, they have to decide whether they think the existing permit process covers their issues or not, or if they want to do something um, in addition. I pointed out that you know the, the bottled water industry actually volunteered to be under um, permits. They wanted the permit. And so um, pointed out that you know there may be some considerations that they want are special specifically for these kind of data centers. But that's what they're going to have to talk about inside. They invited a lot of people, a lot of uh, interest groups, a uh, number of council members. I just thought the whole council should be aware of this. And if anybody else wants to add to it, those kind of maybe. If they want to ask a question, but then after Dave, I wanted to touch on something. If the, in addition, I was in the same meeting, so I wanted to touch on. So well, why don't you go ahead and, it, and then we'll see a okay. question for after. Well, a question for you, Dave Hamilton. Mm -hmm. um, in your water use slash tool 101 thing you did this morning, which of course I had a scheduling conflict, I, I had missed, but did you get into the compact requirements in terms of when regional notice is required for consumptive use? We had consumptive use versus full. We talked, it, we talked a little bit about that, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I mean, from the really stressed how the contact came to be and, and the parts of that is underlying why we're doing what we're doing, but I think they needed to understand it. I think that came across very well. Just a little bit, I focused mainly on the permitting process. Oh, we talked a little bit about the uh, Great Lakes. Okay. So there was, in the meeting that we were in, they did, they, the legislators did seem to have some confusion specifically regarding the self use amounts with these data centers that they concerned that it's 100% consumptive use all lost to the atmosphere. And when is regional notice required under the compact and what does that mean? So as a refresher. And, and just, and Jim, I think that you had put in the chat, I think that actually answered their question. I think they felt satisfied with that. But just for everybody's benefit here that wasn't in the past. So consumptive, there's a difference between total use and consumptive use. So consumptive use being everything that is either lost to the environment for evaporation, for example, or incorporation into a product, be another example. But if that consumptive use is above 5 million gallons a day, then regional notice is required under the Great Lakes Compact. And to date, 14, 15 years into the program, we haven't had one of those. This has come up yet, but there seemed to be some confusion. And the other thing mm -hmm. about that, the other thing that that Jim is that's notice, it doesn't require approval. Right. It's very different. Yeah. 
Dave Lush. Uh, just to confirm, uh, I think my question was answered by what Jim was just saying, but I wanted to ask, are all these data centers going to be a total consumptive use or are some of them uh, passed through to discharge? Um, that's a good question that uh, apparently I have had no involvement in discussions on this, so someone else might speak if they have. But apparently there's been discussion with them that maybe there are other ways of doing things other than the evaporative cooling. But the industry, for whatever reason, thinks that's the way to go. So that's their position based on further discussions, maybe something else could be uh, worked out. But um, that's what came out in this meeting. Other details I don't know, Dave, but uh, I know that others have raised that issue. With them. Great. And to date, we haven't had a part 327 permit application coming in for a data center, but if we get one in the future, it's specifically called out in the compact decision criteria, not so much in the part 327 <coughs> decision criteria, looking at the use of the water. So this is a, as efficient as possible. Are you minimizing waste? So that would be if you're talking about cooling water, are you able to recirculate and reduce the evaporative losses that way? So that would be one of the things that we would look at during our permit review. That is um, another tangent, but some of this is very similar in nature to the some of the large scale aquaculture, like aqua bounding or the Muskegon one that kind of came and went, where implicitly trying to avoid a cost of an alternative by saying we want to use this amount consumptive per day. And that's a year or two ago. That's why I kind of signaled as far as the water conservation and efficiency puts us in a little bit of a weird situation. There's water user sectors that have to use water. There really is no replacement, no matter what you what you can afford. And then there's operations where there is, but it's more expensive. And those are those are very different. And this one, this is lining up a lot like some of the, the one-time flow through aquaculture facilities using groundwater one time, avoiding the recirculating filter system. So it has has a lot of similarities to some voids we have in there. What, what we view as water conservation best practices. I guess it depends on what you mean by efficiency. Right. Evaporative, 100% evaporative cooling would be the most efficient from an energy standpoint, and they would pump the least amount of water. But they use it the most water. So I mean, you could argue they're efficient. Frank has something too. Yeah. Uh, I just, I was part of the, I've had conversations with Senator Bayer for about a month uh, as, as she was starting to think about this issue and as constituents were talking to her uh, and she wanted to get what the tribe's take on this was. Uh, and we don't, at this point, hadn't had a, an official position from the tribes, but uh, she was quite, uh, she didn't understand the system, how the compact came into being. Uh, she asked me to speak just about the beginning of the compact, and then others spoke about how it actually works and, and the details on the ground, which were things I think that are important. But the the problem that I saw was they wanted to solve a problem, but they weren't there were a, a lot of unintended consequences to any of the any of the processes by which they or any of the product that they were going to try to create to solve what they perceived as a problem. And so, uh the so that what's happened is there are data centers in other states that have caused issues in other states and those other st people in those other states have been calling our environmental folks in, in, in Michigan getting them upset and concerned about what's happening with the data centers coming here and so there's a lot of pressure on the legislature to do something about this. Of course, that would require legislation. If they had legislation, that might do regulation. And so there's initially, I heard some talk about changing the compact. And I said, well, you know, it took a long time to get that compact in place. I don't think changing the compact is a, is a viable alternative. And then they talked about, well, you know, how what about our laws? And then they wanted to know what the, they needed to understand a lot of what, people from the, the 
the water quality uh, water quality council here, and also they are uh, uh, some others were able to tell everybody what the actual what they were working with. And I think that that I'm glad to hear that you had that that uh, training session that some of the uh, Senate staff came to. And I think that's a really good point because they needed to understand how this all works. So there was a good chance that they were that there was going to be an attempt somehow to somehow modify our existing law to fix this problem. And the question was, what kind of use was it? I think the idea that that they were looking for the most economical use, which is you know 100% evaporation as cooling, as opposed to having to treat the water and return it. Uh, and uh, and the other question was, were they using surface water or groundwater when they were doing this? These are all questions that are up in the air, and I just wanted to talk about this a bit and and give you know give my perspective on it. But I really appreciated you know, everybody's input on it. I thought it was really good, and I think that the the legislators left in a much better place than where they were when we started in terms of just trying to solve the problem and figuring out we'll just we'll just change the regulations and that'll solve it without realizing that there would be considerable possibility of of causing like as i said unintended consequences in other areas uh other areas of use so uh this uh i know there'll be more meetings coming up but I'm really glad that we're talking about it here at this meeting because it is something that will affect or at least interact with all of the work that we're doing. So thank you. Thanks. James, do you have a comment? Let I mean, me I'll just jump in. I mean, obviously, this is an ongoing conversation. Um, it is good that they are educating themselves on this space they are talking about. Uh, they came in, many of them, pretty unknowledgeable about kind of what happened to this space. So um, I hear, I'm hearing from them that they're getting more comfortable about, okay, what's the arena of Michigan? You know, how do we do things? And the truth is, is that the compact has strengthened laws on water use in all of the Great Lakes states in a way that's not in other parts of the country. The, you know, the the boogeyman in the closet is, you know, Virginia. And there's one three county area in Virginia that I've heard has 250 data centers. So, you know, you get into a scale of use at that level in an area that isn't as regulated. And I think that's kind of, you know, what they came hearing stories about. So, again, as we hear more, if we think anything is actually going to happen, we'll, we'll kind of keep you informed. But at this point, they're they're just discussions. I. I appreciate Dave, you bringing up the, the conversation they had with the legislators. Thank you very much for educating them. Um, it, you know, it raises my alarm bells a little bit when they start talking about, oh, we don't like data centers, oh, we don't like bottled water, oh, we don't like this, that, or the other thing, but everybody else's water use is okay. Because that's one of the strengths of the compact and of our state laws is that we're kind of blind to what you're going to use the water for. It, you know, the key is you've got to be efficient with it. You've got to, you know, you've got to share you're conserving it. You've got, you know, you've got to do the work of, you know, getting it through the tool or getting it through a permit process uh, or an SSR. So, you know, and then from that point, go forth and do, do good things. Um, cause I, cause I really get concerned when we start getting people who want to start picking winners and losers when it comes to who gets access to the water. And that, and that'll probably be another good point to drive home with those folks to say, hey, you know, you may not like data centers, but what if you like golf and somebody else doesn't? Because <laughs> they use a lot of water too. What if you like food? <laughs> Who uses a lot of water? I, I I would say I hear you and, and you're right, philosophically. I think um, the one distinction is they're, I believe they're also talking about possible major state investment funds, tax breaks, incentive programs for this and wanting to make sure that if they're helping support it, that they can kind of approach it a little bit more scrutiny than just the standing regulations for all industries. Actually, it's it's kind of a separate item, but I just wanted to bring up an editorial that was in the New York Times a week ago. Did you see the title? Will we have to pump the Great Lakes, California, to feed the nation? And it's a professor. Come and take it. <laughs> it's, it's, a <laughs> it's a professor from, I believe, Arizona. I can't access it now. Uh, water policy guy talking about the need to, you know, 
conserve water, figure out the situation in the West. But he repeated this a couple of times, like this was a valid right. uh, potential option yeah. in without, any, without any background. And, and it was a friend of mine sent me this at like mm -hmm. 11 in the evening, and I was just really irritated when I was bad, but, but I'm surprised that it hasn't come Well, up. in my site, I used the very old picture of the uh, People with uh, sombreros and cowboy hats with straws. Right, right. 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 the back off sucker. Yeah, I'll be like, said it too. So I, this I, is why we have this law. Yeah. Well, and I think I, the way that article was written, I think part of it was she kind of raised the ire, not a little seriousness, but it was, it was still. Yeah, I think he knows about the compact. I think he purposely didn't mention it to try to get it piled up. No, yeah. No, yeah. Now, and that's what was irritating. Not all people know about the common. I mean, I've heard of discussions no. in other state legislatures where they have to be told, no, that would violate federal law. Right. That's the first time and, they have heard an international that, treaty. That, yeah. that prospect. And then they usually back off when they realize they're you know, requesting a violation of federal law. But, you know, it's, uh, it's well, a, it, And what irritated me is he, he represented himself as a water policy specialist yeah. you know so it, it was it was just a i'm surprised you didn't point. bring up the the other idea that i've seen floated which is taking water from the mississippi river you know we can't take from the great lakes because compact let's take it from the mississippi river and increase the chicago diversion of course yeah. well, okay you know, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. you have the dates uh the fifth i think it was i think it was the fifth if you, if you get a copy of this, if you get a copy of this, if you get a copy of this, any other yeah, open I, I have to get to a place like any other any other open comments online in the room. Yeah, All right. Well. Um, I'll skip the governance of asking for a motion and approval to adjourn since we're on the forum and say thank you all for being here and for meeting us adjourned. Yeah. We'll see you in a month. Good job, Bye. Hey, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you next to the hospital? Yeah, I was at Agro Expo this morning and uh, yeah. and had to I also screenshot it off so I to get to do a yeah. lunch for the class on the team I when I was out there. So I was like, but, I yeah, but lunch, I think but I'm just saying, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm leaving yeah. staff for four days. But yeah, it's good, good, it's good morning out there. I mean, the weather's fantastic. You know, for once, it's not 90 degrees or pouring down right now. So, 